Welcome to the weekly podcast of First United Methodist Church in Costa Mesa, California. Founded in 1912, the church gathers on Sundays at 10 a.m., and we invite you to join us anytime. For more information, visit our website, costamesafirstumc.com, or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Ah, friends, I'm having so much fun with Jonah. Is anyone else having fun with Jonah? Just pretend, make your pastor happy. Yeah, perfect. Um, It is, I feel like everywhere I look and turn, I'm getting more and more images of people talking about this really strange story. In fact, um, artists, friends of mine who are artists, people have been like posting things about this story. And as we've talked about before, this story is really a parable, It's a a story, and we know that for a couple of reasons that we'll dig into, but it doesn't mean that it is any less true. And by true, I mean it doesn't mean that there's not any more wisdom for us or something that God is telling us about God's own character and who we are in the kingdom of God. So let us pray, and then we're going to jump into this really fun story. God, as always, I simply ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts gathered here in this space will be acceptable to you because, God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I recently had someone who told me that I need to start praying here in this space and online because they listen online. So I'll need to add that as a prayer amendment. There is this incredible thing about the story of Jonah. Jonah and the whale. And we sort of have talked, if you've been kind of joining us, I know as we get into the summer series, we're kind of in and out, and so we might miss some Sundays. So let me catch you up a little bit about the Jonah story. I shared the first week that the Jonah story is most likely a parable, but if you grew up going to church, you might have had your Sunday school teacher teach you about Jonah and the whale, right? And then when you get older, and you read, and you discover it was a big fish, right? It was a big fish, not a whale, and you think, that liar. And then maybe I'm the only one who has the bitterness towards that. Okay, but I did grow up hearing this story in Sunday school, but it was more of sort of a warning of what happens when you don't obey God, right? You get thrown into the water. And again, when I read the story, this parable, this understanding, I I started to read it the first week we talked about how it could be a parable. We know this from a couple of things. First of all, it's incredibly exaggerated, right? It is the biggest storm. And if you don't know the story, it's the story of a prophet who God tells, hey, go and tell the people of Nineveh, by the way, who are the Assyrians, who are like the worst of the worst. They used to put people's heads on sticks. I mean, these are not good guys and girls and apparently animals, we'll learn later, um, so bad that they, you don't want to go there. And so Jonah does what? We're told that Jonah flees from the presence of God and he gets on a ship and then he meets the sailors, and then there's a horrible storm that can only be described by our current president because we're told it is the biggest storm that has ever been, right? It's bigly. It's a big storm, right? Huge storm. This storm's big. And so in this storm, the sailors, the surprising ones, say, hey, um, pray to all of your gods, and we'll see if one of them sticks, And we're often, when I was younger, I was given the impression that the sailors are so worried about the storm that they throw Jonah over. But that's not what happens. See, Jonah still doesn't want to fulfill this call that God has given upon him. So he says, throw me into the water. This one is my fault. And so they do. See, it was Jonah's choice to leave the presence of God. And it's Jonah's choice to go into the water, into the depth. And it's a parable It's a story. We know this partly because it's so different than the rest of the Hebrew scriptures because this is a prophet and we're not learning about the prophet's call. Instead, we're hearing the story of the prophet and that's a little bit unique. Also, most prophetic stories in the Hebrew scriptures will give us some sort of hint of when this was. It'll mention a king. It'll mention a kingdom. This does not. It floats by itself. The only king that's mentioned 
we'll talk about later and why that couldn't have actually been a king. It's this weird sort of story just sort of floating out there. It doesn't require. And and what's interesting is we often read scripture and we go back and it's almost like we want to read it to explain how it has to be real. Someone was uh, sharing with me yesterday that they read this whole entire paper that someone had written about how a person could survive inside a fish. Like, I don't want people to think us Christians are crazy or us Jewish people are crazy, and so we need to explain how you can survive inside of a fish, which might be an adventure in missing the point. Although I would kind of like to read it, so if you can find it, please send it to me. I'm sure I can Google it. There is this bigness about this story, this craziness, but no king is highlighted This is never meant to be a historical story, but we do this. We read back and we try to say, well, this is how this went. Instead of maybe hearing the story for what the story was originally meant to be heard for, it's telling us something about God and our relationship to God. So the first week we talked about what would it mean if it was a parable and not just to make sure you follow God. Week two, we talked about, um, remember week two is where we started seeing all these red, these are called paramounts up here, right? And we had the red coming from the top to symbolize what? Pentecost Sunday, not all at once, yes. Um, Pentecost Sunday, which is the celebration of when the Holy Spirit came to the people and they began to hear the story of God in their own language. And so we talked about how sometimes the surprising voices that we hear the message of God from, not always um, in the language we think we'll hear it in, it's an unexpected place. And that's the same with the story of Jonah because the sailors are the ones who seem to have more faith than the person who's supposed to be the prophet. They didn't want to throw him over. And even when they do, there is this sense of, oh, let us now worship God. And remember, we further have instances where we're understanding this as a parable because it says, let us now worship God in this place. We will give uh, promises. We will vow all these things that, by the way, a prophet should do in a temple. They're saying we'll do on this boat, which was not how it was done at the time. So this is, again, part of an exaggerated story, but it is a reminder that sometimes we decide where the voice of God will come from, and we're often surprised by the Holy Spirit in Pentecost, but also from the people who get the message of God. And if we notice, it's usually the outsider, right? Now then we come to week three. Last week we talked about, I know I said it wasn't a whale, but there is a term in script writing or movie watching called the belly of the whale, right? What's the belly of the whale moment is when you think the character is at their lowest point, which I think we would all agree would be inside of a giant fish, right? And if you're wondering what that smells like, go down to the Newport Pier and just stand there for a while And eventually the wind will turn and you'll think, oh, I would not want to do this. There is a three-day experience for Jonah. And when he is in this belly of the whale, we talked about something that I mentioned because I get really excited about it, and that is the Hebrew uh, starts out as male, then when he's in the belly of the fish, the fish is referred to in female, and then when he comes, is spit out, the fish is again referred to in male. Why do I think that's neat? Because if you're hearing that for the first time, if you are a Hebrew hearing this story, what you might think is that there's something about pregnancy or being born or being born again when Jonah is spit out. There's something about that. There's this beauty in the idea of maybe something new is being born in the belly of the whale. For those of us who have gone through rough seasons, and if you're a human in this room, you've gone through rough seasons Oftentimes, the belly of the whale moment can feel like the worst, or maybe you're in that right now. I don't know how to get out of this. I don't know how anything could happen. And and it's not just sort of this look for the silver lining, but it's like God works in incredible ways in the midst of this. What's interesting is that Jonah uses other people's words. When he's in the midst of this, he uses the Psalms and he sings. It's like this beautiful, and and he doesn't know what will happen, but he's still saying, God, I know that you're present, and I tried to get away from you, and I can't. I shared last week that some of us who have gone through sort of the process of what often is called deconstruction, where we try to 
get away from the things we've been told about God, but there's something still about the divine that calls to us, even in the midst of the belly of the whale, and we find ourselves singing old songs or repeating some part of scripture that meant a lot to us. There's something that holds us to this story because it is our story with God. It's this beautiful thing. And then we come this week to the moment... I just love, I, by the way, one of my favorite things, and I say it all the time, is like this story is ridiculous and I love turning around and you guys are like, yep, it's about right. So let's look a little bit at what happens to the conversion of all of Nineveh, which is a five word sermon. I've never changed anyone's mind with five words. Five word sermon. And it's, I'm gonna say, kind of piss poor. Like, it's not his best, right? He, like, walks in. We're told that it's a big city. Again, it's a great city. And it says God thought it was a great city. And he walks in, and he's got three days. Three is always important, friends. If you see a seven or a three in the Bible, we're being told something here. Again, the reminder of Christ, three days. Transformation, three days. As he is walking across the city, he simply yells this out. This is it, guys. This is the best sermon. Are you ready? This is it. 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And then he like runs away. I did my job. I'm good. It's like if I were to come in and be like, God loves you and just leave. And then you guys are like, that was really deep and moving, and I don't know, but I feel the love of God. And then you go and change the world. Like, that was it. Five words. But he didn't want to even give those. And if we look at it, it's such a different story because Jonah is not like any other prophet. Moses and Jeremiah, they didn't want to share the prophetic word because they thought they were inadequate. Elijah didn't want to because he feared for his life because you know, emperors took heads. He didn't want to go and give this message. Isaiah was afraid to share the message because he thought it was too dreadful and awful. None of these are Jonah's complaints. Jonah is worried that God may be too loving. And the people that Jonah think don't deserve the love of God could be capable of change. Jonah and Elisha are the only two people called to go outside of their own people group. They're called to go to these foreign places far and proclaim something that seems so big, and they don't want to do it. Jonah's short sermon, 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. But let's see what we notice about this. First of all, it's not like any other prophetic proclamation. Usually they would go into a city, and by the way, People did this all the time. They would go into cities and yell, thus says the Lord, and then say something. Not our pal Jonah. He doesn't even tell them who the message is from, right? He's just like, hey, um, people of Nineveh, you might um, overthrow him. Okay, bye. Like, you know, there's this, like, no sense of who it's come from. What's interesting for us as a reader is we don't know what God tells him to say. We don't know what God tells him to say. And even Jonah doesn't mention God in this at all, nor is he saying this is an oracle of God. And where do the 40 days come from? Is that like, well, like, I've heard of like Exodus, I'm just gonna throw 40 days in. Like, that's a long time. It's like, if you've ever seen any of the Austin Powers movie, there's just, and if you haven't, there's this great scene where this guy is screaming and afraid and slowly inching towards him is one of those things that makes asphalt flat. And all you can think if you're watching this is like, the guy has time to move, right? Well, this prophet is like, you got 40 days to clean up your act. You'd be like, great, that's 39 days to have some fun. And then in the last day, we'll turn it around, right? 40 days is a long time. Again, you need to hear this as a message, not to the Assyrians and not to Nineveh, but to Israel, you guys had time to turn your life around, right? 40 would have meant something in their tradition, 40 years. And remember Jesus later, 40 days. There's something about 40. There is a memory, like there's a, a shared memory. We have shared memories, don't we? 
stories that are passed down from community to community, from time to time. So here's the shared story of 40 days. It will, 40 days, and he runs out. And it's interesting and helpful when we hear this because I wonder how many messages, um, kind of like he's, He's got no understanding of what could happen, and yet this amazing and incredible thing happens. And this is helpful for those of us who preach, because sometimes we'll think, I don't know, I'm just going to throw this thing and whatever sticks to the wall for people, right? What's incredible, and several of my friends have said, is you'll preach a sermon that you are pretty sure is about one thing, and someone will come out to you and say, thank you for speaking about what to do with my mother. And you're like, I didn't even mention your mother. This was about, like, don't eat that. Like, it it has nothing to do with it, but somebody has this experience. See, God can take a message that was meant for one thing and use it in a different way. Think of Joseph, what you meant for bad, God turned to good. So even this message that Jonah gives, what Jonah meant for, hey, let's destroy you, God uses it as a message that reaches the people. It's incredible. And for those of us who have to give messages, it's helpful. It's also helpful for those of us who have ever sat through a sermon that didn't sit quite right with us. This doesn't feel right, right? Maybe the message wasn't right, but something in it was a gift from God. Maybe it was that thing that said, maybe this is my community, or maybe this isn't my, my community, or maybe there's something about this that I'm being asked to address. It's incredible how messages that are meant for one thing can turn and be used for something else. It's beautiful. What I also want us to notice about this story it talks about the kingdom of God in a way that if, if we don't pay close attention to, we might miss. See, who changes first? The people. It's not the king. It's not those high up. You know, I imagine Jonah, I don't know why in my mind it's like the Ricola commercials. Like he like finds a hill, yells the thing, and then takes off, right? Letting it spread throughout the land, whoever hits. But the people react first. And, and remember, as the story is being told, it is being told as this is what the kingdom of God is like. It's that the people, it becomes a grassroots movement where people are acting into a new way of life. They've changed from where they're focused on themselves. They're starting to notice their neighbors. They're mourning and grieving their behavior from before. It says even the animals are wearing sackcloth. Can you picture this? We live in Orange County. You can 100% picture animals in clothes. See it daily, right? There is this ground swell of change. Yesterday when we were here for uh, the United We Stand event, one of the things he said I thought was really helpful was the idea that like we, there cannot be one leader. That's not our salvation, one person, and we forget that sometimes, whether good, you know, however you want to classify the leader as good or bad, or, you know, my party or not my party, that it never is that. It's when it's a groundswell of people. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of the people who are mutually in community together, loving each other, reacting to God together. Now, here's what I want us to also notice. Jonah gives a message, basically, it's just Jonah yelling out, hey, this needs to change or you're going to die. Isn't that like positive? Isn't that like, oh, sounds great, I'm going to do that. I always think that, by the way, and I've shared this before, the people who have like the really mean, the end is near signs, who's joining that party? Like they don't even look happy to be there. Like if they had some like happy music or something to go with that message, maybe people would sign up. But I wonder how many people have like passed the signs and been like, oh, I'm awful, tell me more. Like, that's not a helpful message. And Jonah does something very similar, and there's surprising results. He yells this message, but what is the response of the people? It says, and the people of Nineveh believed God. They didn't believe Jonah. Somehow, in whatever message they got from that, they believed God. You've probably been told some great messages. For sure you've been told some not so great messages. But in it, what have you been told that can help you believe in the divine, in God? 
I have a weird job. I was sharing this last night with a group of friends where like every week I deliver something and you guys are like, eh, I liked it, eh, it was all right. You know, it's like almost this weird sort of like performance art that no one ever talks about, right? But what in it, if we take the messenger out, if we take the person, if we take Jonah out of the story, there's something profound and the people respond. Now, what's also odd about this story and more people should be shocked about it, says the king of Nineveh. Now, why do we know this is a parable? Nineveh is a city. They wouldn't have had a king. At most, they would have had like kind of a mayor kind of person. But again, the story needs to be big, so it's the king of Nineveh reacts. But reacts late. Hey, guys, uh, I think we should all start uh, fasting. And everyone's like, yeah, we've been fasting. Hello? What does this tell us about the kingdom of God? Well, it tells us that the people react first, and then those in power respond. And we know this, don't we? I know this as someone who works for a United Methodist Church that like I am praying for all that the bishops and everyone's trying to do, but I know that they cannot be our salvation. We must participate with the action of God to force a movement. It takes too long for the message to get there. It's how we are together. The message of God sometimes isn't given well, but it is given clear, and it's not one of You better change. It's one of, I care about you. And so the people respond. And there's surprising results. Now, there's a couple things I also want us to notice about Jonah. See, Jonah is told to get up and go. And it's important to hear this language. It's movement. Get up and go. Because the opposite language in Hebrew is used here. It says he goes down to Tarshish. He's in down into the ship. He is choosing down when God is asking him to get up. He is choosing to go backward when God is saying to go forwards. How many of us have this sense that there is something we need to move forward in, but it is so much easier to stay, we feel like, in the comfortable of what we know and what we're, like, we feel good about? I thought it was helpful. I I read this quote that says, in the waves of change, we find our direction. Waves are very, like, kind of disruptive, right? Uh, You'll be, I, I like to paddleboard a lot in the back bay here, and I bring my dog with me, and my dog is all for it until, like, literally he gets on the front of the, like, board like a bow spritz. He's just like, here I am, world. And he barks at dogs, like, he'll bark at, like, a bird. My dog doesn't bark in the real world, but on my board, he's very mighty. So he'll stand on the end in this sort of, like, almost, like, pointer dog moment. Lots of people take pictures of us. Um, He's just sort of on the end until we hit a wave, and then my dog is right here. I don't know how he makes himself so small, but he gets right here in between my, just like, this is not okay. Like, I was so brave, and now I am not, right? Right? And I think about us, how it's often those bumps and waves that make us notice something else. Tenor remembers I'm there when we hit the waves. He remembers that if he gets really small and really close to me, he's safe. I wonder what the waves in our own lives are, those things like, what are we being called up to go to? And I also want to say to our brothers and sisters who want to go backwards, God is never backwards, always forwards always in the present. And it's us who choose to go back into the chaos. What is God calling us up and towards? How are we going to find our direction? I love the language, by the way, is almost exactly the same. The people of Nineveh's response to cry out to God, by the way, that's what they say the animals even are crying out to God. Picture that one. The animals, everything is crying out to God. It's the same as the sailors when they said, maybe if we cry out to God, God will save us. There is something beautiful about the faith of the people that are sailors and the faith of the people of Nineveh, and they are the outsiders. Who are our outsiders? Who do we feel like is beyond the love of God? And what would it look like for us to get up and go to those places? It's a hard call. I don't like it. I don't like sometimes that God's love is so big because I want to decide who's in and out. 
Also, now I sit in and out close to lunch. You're welcome. We have this sense that God is calling us toward something. My hope in my prayer is as we get into this last week that we don't respond because Jonah is going to respond. You know, he's so happy when the people of Nineveh change. He just is really for it. That's not the end of the story, by the way. That's how we end it with children. But Jonah's a little bit of a sulky guy. So we're going to talk about how sometimes when people don't get their just desserts, what that can feel like, but what God could be calling us toward. So let us pray as I invite our band forward. God, sometimes we don't understand your love. It is so expansive and big that it would include even those we don't want to include. God, sometimes we ourselves have given a message or heard a message that we kind of have distorted. We have lost the plot a little bit. And like Jonah, we are surprised by the results. We are grateful God, that in the midst of all of this, you continue to erase the lines we create and that your love is ever expansive, big enough to include even us. Lord, it's in your name that we pray. Amen.